Number three, Joan Harrison. On November 23, 1975, Joan Harrison, a 26-year-old mother of two, was found in a garage in Preston, which is an area in northeast London, England. Harrison had been addicted to morphine, and she worked as a sex worker. She had been kicked and stomped to death after she was sexually assaulted. The police conducted a major investigation into the murder, but it turned up nothing. Then in March 1978, the lead investigator of the Yorkshire Ripper Task Force received a letter from a person claiming to be the Yorkshire Ripper. By this point, the man dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper had killed eight women. The first murder happened on October 30th, 1975, about three weeks before Joan Harrison was killed. 28-year-old mother of four and sex worker, Wilma McCain, had been hit with a hammer and stabbed to death in Leeds. Two and a half months later, 42-year-old Emily Jackson, who worked as a part-time sex worker, was found murdered in Leeds. She had been sexually assaulted, hit multiple times in the head with a hammer, and stabbed 52 times with a screwdriver. On May 9, 1976, a 20-year-old woman in Leeds was attacked, but she survived. It would be nearly a year before there was another attack. Then on February 5, 1977, 28-year-old Irene Richardson was found beaten with a hammer and stabbed to death in Leeds. Like the other victims, she was a sex worker. Two and a half months later, Patricia Atkinson, a 32-year-old sex worker, was found beaten and stabbed to death in her apartment in Bradford. On June 26, 1977, about two months after the last murder, 16-year-old Jane McDonald was killed near a playground in Leeds after a night out with friends. Unlike the other victims, Jane was not a sex worker. But just like the other victims, she had been sexually assaulted, beaten with a hammer, and stabbed multiple times. About three months later, on the night of October 9, 1997, a woman's body was found in an isolated area in Manchester. She was identified as Jean Jordan, who was 20 years old and worked as a sex worker. The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. She had probably been beaten in the head with a hammer. Then over a week later, her body had been stabbed. The police suspected that the killer went back to the body, possibly to retrieve something that he left behind, and for some unknown reason, he stabbed the body. Four months later, there was another murder in Bradford. On January 31, 1981, an 18-year-old sex worker named Helen Reika was found in Huddersfield, beaten to death with a hammer. Then on March 8, 1981, a letter arrived at the office of the Yorkshire Ripper Task Force. In the letter, the author said he planned to rid the streets of sex workers. He also took credit for killing Tracy McDonald and for killing Joan Harrison. Five days later, the newspaper, the Daily Mirror, received a letter from the same writer and he once again took credit for the murder of Harrison. He then went on to write that most of the victims had been young, but he would kill an older woman next. Both letters were signed off with the name, Jack the Ripper. Before the letters, the police did not think that the Yorkshire Ripper was responsible for the murder of Joan Harrison. But she was a sex worker who was beaten to death, so after the letters, the police thought it was possible that she could have been one of his victims. Just over two weeks after the second letter was received, on March 26, 1978, the body of a young woman was found in a field in Bradford. She was identified as 21-year-old Yvonne Pearson, a sex worker. She went missing two months earlier on January 21, 1978, 10 days before Helen Reika was killed. 
Pearson had been killed by blunt force trauma to the head. Under one of her arms was a copy of the February 21st, 1978 edition of the Daily Mirror. It is suspected that the killer went back to the body a month after the murder and put the newspaper under her arm. Then on May 16th, 1978, sex worker Vera Millward was beaten and stabbed to death in Manchester. She was the first woman to be murdered after the letters had been received. The author of the letters was correct. Billward was older than the average victim. She was 40 years old. Since she was the first victim to be killed after the letters, the police thought that the author really was the killer. But there was one oddity. In the first letter, the author wrote that the police were incorrect when they said he had only killed seven women. He said he had killed an eighth woman, Joan Harrison. But by the time the letters were mailed, the Yorkshire Ripper had killed Helen Reicha and her body had just not been found. The author does not mention Reicha in either letter. Why would the author brag about committing one murder the police didn't connect to the Yorkshire Ripper case but not write about another murder that he supposedly committed just weeks before the letters were sent? Nevertheless, the police thought that there was enough valid information in the letters to believe that they were written by the Yorkshire Ripper. The rest of 1978 was a quiet one for the Ripper. Then in March 1979, a year after receiving the first letter, the head of the Yorkshire Ripper Task Force received another letter from a man claiming to be the Ripper. In the letter, the author wrote that he knew that Vera Millward had spent time in the hospital before she was killed. The police didn't think that this was common knowledge, but they thought it was something that the killer might have known. This further convinced them that the author was the Yorkshire Ripper. On April 4th, 1979, less than two weeks after the task force received the letter, the Ripper struck again. This time he beat and stabbed 19-year-old Josephine Whitaker to death. Whitaker was not a sex worker. Instead, she was a clerk at a mortgage company. She was attacked in Halifax as she was walking home after visiting her grandparents. Two months after that murder, the task force received an audio cassette from the writer of the letters. On the recording, a man taunts the police and says that he will kill again. The man had a Sutherland accent, which is a city north of London. Because of the recording, the police started looking for a suspect that lived or at least grew up in Sutherland. Five months after the task force received the tape, on September 2nd, 1979, 20-year-old university student, Barbara Leach, was walking home after spending the evening at a pub with some friends in Bradford. The next day, her body was found about 200 yards from where her friends last saw her. Like Josephine Whitaker, she had been beaten with a hammer and stabbed with a screwdriver. On August 21, 1980, nearly a year after the last murder, the body of 47-year-old Marguerite Walls was found not far from her home in Leeds. She was attacked the night before after she left her job as a civil servant. She had worked late that night because she was planning on leaving on vacation the next morning. She was hit with a hammer and then strangled to death. On the night of November 17, 1980, about three months after the last murder, a 20-year-old university student named Jacqueline Hill was walking from the bus to her home. Someone found her handbag not far from the bus stop and it was splattered with blood, so they called the police. The police found her body a few hundred feet from the bag. She had been stabbed with a screwdriver and beaten with a hammer. One and a half months later, on January 2nd, 1981, a police officer came upon a couple in their car in a red light district at Broom Hill. 
He ran the license plate of the car, and it turned out that the license plates were stolen. The couple was ordered to get out of the car. The driver of the car was identified as 34-year-old Peter Sutcliffe, and the woman was a sex worker. Sutcliffe was arrested for the stolen license plates. At the police station, officers immediately noticed that Sutcliffe looked a lot like the sketches of the Yorkshire Ripper. He was interviewed for two days, during which time his home and his vehicle were extensively searched. Then, nearly 48 hours after he was arrested, Sutcliffe started confessing. In total, he admitted to killing 13 women. One murder that he did not confess to was the murder of Joan Harrison. Sutcliffe also said that he didn't write the letters, nor did he record the tape. The police know that Sutcliffe was born and raised in London, and he did not have a Sutherland accent. DNA testing would later confirm that Sutcliffe was telling the truth. His DNA did not match the DNA found on Joan Harrison, nor did it match the DNA found on the letters. Also, the DNA found on Joan Harrison did not match the DNA that was found on the letters either. In 2005, the DNA found under the seal of one of the envelopes was inputted into the United Kingdom National DNA Database. It was matched to an unemployed alcoholic named John Humble. Humble was not involved in the Yorkshire Ripper murders, nor was he involved in the murder of Joan Harrison. The letters in the audio cassette were just a disturbing hoax. Humble was ultimately sentenced to eight years of prison for sending the letters and the tape. Then in February 2011, the police announced that Joan Harrison's murder had been solved. Three years earlier, in January 2008, a man named Christopher Smith had been arrested for drinking and driving. Smith had a violent criminal history. In 1981, he was convicted of attempted sexual assault on a 17-year-old girl. For the conviction, he served two years and nine months in prison. Not long after he was released, his pregnant wife, Violet, was found dead from a stab wound. Smith was charged with her murder, and in 1984, he went to trial. At his trial, Smith said that he and Violet were having an argument, and she fell onto the knife. He was convicted of manslaughter, and he was given a suspended sentence. When he was arrested for drinking and driving in 2006, a sample of his DNA was taken. His DNA was entered into the database, and it was matched to the DNA taken from Joan Harrison's murder. But the match came too late. Six days after he was arrested for drinking and driving, Smith died from lung cancer. In his possession, his family found a three-page deathbed confession that he wrote the day before he died. The letter had several grammatical and spelling mistakes, so the following reading is what Smith intended to say instead of a word-for-word -word reading. His letter reads, To who it concerns, I would like to put the record straight. I can't go on with the guilt. I have lived with it for over 20 years. I am truly sorry for all the pain I have caused to anyone. Please believe me when I say, I am sorry. I love my grandkids and my daughter. I cannot go back to prison anymore. Please God, help my family who I worship. I have been out of trouble for over 20 years, so please God, help me. I am so sorry. God forgive me. I love you all forever. The police said that even though Smith doesn't flat out say he killed Harrison in the letter, he shows remorse for something that he was never arrested for. Since his DNA was linked to Joan Harrison's murder, they are sure he was referring to her murder throughout the letter. Smith's family said he was always paranoid and he would become frightened anytime someone knocked on the door. 
The police said that if Smith had not died, based on the DNA, they would have charged him with the murder of Joan Harrison. The police went on to say that it's regretful that Smith didn't face justice, but they hoped that learning who killed her will give Joan Harrison's family a small amount of closure. Number 2. Brenda Sue Brown In 1966, Brenda Sue Brown was 11 years old. She was the oldest of seven children, and three years earlier, her family had moved to Shelby, North Carolina. At 8 o'clock a.m. on July 27, 1966, it was already hot in Shelby. Brenda, Sue, and her sisters spent the early morning fighting over a makeup compact. At about 8.30 a.m., Brenda, Sue's mother asked her to walk her sister to a preschool class. Brenda, Sue was supposed to come right back home after she dropped off her sister, but she didn't. About an hour after she left the house, Brenda, Sue's mother started searching the neighborhood for her. She looked for over an hour but she found no trace of Brenda Sue, and an official search team was formed. Then, about 11 hours later, Brenda Sue's body was found in a thicket just a short distance from her house. She was partially clothed, but she had not been sexually assaulted. Her skull had been fractured in a dozen places. Not far from her body was a blood-covered rock. It's believed that she was beat to death with the rock. The police immediately had two suspects. One was a bald-headed man who exposed himself to Brenda Sue's sister a few days earlier as she walked to her preschool class. But the police were never able to identify the man. The second was a 13-year-old African-American boy named Robert Roseborough. He lived about a few hundred feet from where Brenda Sue's body was found. Several witnesses saw him in the area where Brenda Sue's body was found around the time that she was killed. The police questioned Robert, but he refused to answer their questions. The police thought that Robert was the killer, but they couldn't prove anything, so he wasn't charged. Two years later, on the morning of June 22, 1968, a mother and daughter went to a custom towel shop in Shelby, but found the door locked. They looked in through a window, and lying on the ground was the nude body of a woman in a pool of blood. A young man also appeared to be in the store. The mother and daughter called the police, and they arrived a few minutes later. They ordered the man to come outside. He refused, so the police threw a tear gas canister into the store. This forced the young man out of the store, and he was arrested. It was Robert Roseboro, who was now 15 years old. The woman inside the store was already dead. She was identified as the owner of the store, 35-year-old Mary Helen Williams. She had been beaten and stabbed multiple times. Although she was nude, she had not been sexually assaulted. Robert said he was innocent, and he had no reason to kill Williams. But besides finding him in the store alone with a dead body, the police also found blood on his clothes and the victim's cigarette lighter in his pocket. In May 1969, Robert went to trial for the murder of Williams. An all-white jury found him guilty and even though he was 15 at the time of the murder, he was sentenced to death. Robert appealed his conviction and death sentence several times, and eventually, his death sentence was commuted to a life sentence. The people of Shelby saw similarities between the murders of Brenda Sue Brown and Mary Helen Williams. For example, both were beaten, and both were released partially undressed, but they had not been sexually assaulted. Also, Robert Roseboro had been the prime suspect in Brenda Sue's murder. So everyone just assumed that Robert had killed Brenda Sue. And for 40 years, 
This is what most people in Shelby believed. But in 2005, two of Brenda's two sisters met with the Shelby Police Department and asked them to reopen the case. Officers looked through the evidence room, but they couldn't find most of the evidence from Brenda Sue's murder. They could only locate one piece of evidence, and it was a bloody palm print that was found on Brenda Sue's shoe. In the hopes that more evidence would be found, the sisters agreed to have Brenda Sue's body exhumed. They dug up her casket, but the remains were just some bones, so no new evidence was found. The next year, a reporter with the newspaper, The Shelby Star, did a 13-segment story about Brenda Sue's murder. Not long after the articles were published, a woman named Laura Lale got in contact with the Shelby Police Department. She told them in late June 2002, her 74-year-old grandfather, Earl Mickey Parker, was dying in a hospital in Shelby. Just before he died, she was sitting with him alone, and he told her that he had done some horrible things in his life, and he had to get something off his chest before he died. Parker said the night before Brenda Sue was killed, he and another man named Thurman Price met at Bootlegger's house in Shelby, and they spent the night there. The next morning, he and Price were walking home, and they happened upon Brenda Sue, who was walking home after she dropped off her sister. Price grabbed Brenda Sue, and he carried her to the thicket. When they got to the thicket, an African-American boy was already there. Price yelled at him to go home, and the boy ran off. It's believed that this boy was Robert Roseboro. The plan was to sexually assault Brenda Sue, but she started to fight with Price, and she scratched his face. So Price picked up a rock, and he hit her in the face with it. Price then told Parker that they needed to kill her, or they would be in serious trouble. Then Price used the rock to beat her to death. Not long after he confessed the murder to his granddaughter, Parker died. The police said that the deathbed confession was consistent with reports from the crime scene. Also, Parker and Price had committed a similar crime in 1954, 12 years before Brenda Sue's murder. They had sexually assaulted a 12-year-old girl in Patterson Springs, North Carolina. That time, they did not kill the girl. They plead guilty to sexual assault, and they were sentenced to three to five years suspended, which meant they received no jail time. In February 2007, the police arrested Thurman Price, who was 79 years old, and he was living a short distance from the crime scene. Price swore he was innocent. The only evidence against him was the deathbed confession, who Parker only supposedly made to one person, which was his granddaughter. Price's lawyer argued that the deathbed confession should be inadmissible, but a judge decided that it could be used as evidence. However, Thurman Price would never go to trial for Brenda Sue's murder. In August 2012, at the age of 83, Price died while awaiting trial. He never admitted to being involved in the murder of Brenda Sue Brown. Number 1. The Crazy Brabant Killers Brabant was a province in central Belgium. People in the area primarily speak two languages, French and Dutch. In 1995, the province was split into two regions in one autonomous area. The northern part of the province, which is the Dutch-speaking area, is now known as Flemish Brabant, while the southern French-speaking region is called Walloon Brabant. The autonomous area is the capital, Brussels, and it is bilingual. Back in the early to mid-1980s, when it was still one province, Brabant was plagued by a horrifying crime spree. The first known crime committed by the crazy Brabant killers actually didn't happen in Brabant. It happened in Dinot, 
which is located in the neighboring Belgian province of Namur. On March 13, 1982, two men slipped into an arms dealer in the city's busy shopping district. They grabbed a rifle with a long barrel that is commonly used to hunt ducks. The owner of the store saw the two men as they were leaving, but he didn't get a good look at them. The two men were seen getting into a car, and they clipped a car as they drove away, but they didn't stop. About a month later, it's believed that the same two men stole a Volkswagen Santana from a dealership's showroom floor in Limbeck, which is a village in Brabant. Three months later, two men broke into a closed grocery store in Montbeige, France. They got into the store by breaking a glass door, and this aroused the attention of a person living near the grocery store. That person called the police, and three officers arrived on the scene. The two robbers started firing at the police, and the officers returned fire. One officer was shot, and then the two robbers got into a VW Santana, and they drove away. The officer who was shot survived the shooting. Money did not seem to be the motive of the break-in. Instead, the two men stole random things like wine and coffee. About a month and a half later, on September 30th, 1982, three armed men entered an armory in War Brabant. Inside the armory were the owner and two customers. All three were beaten and tied up. The three men grabbed 15 guns and ammunition, but they didn't grab the guns at random. Instead, they appeared to know what guns they wanted, and they took the ammo that corresponded with the guns. A 33-year-old police officer named Claude Halud was patrolling the area, and he was alerted that there was a robbery in progress. He went to the armory, and as he approached, he was shot twice in the chest and once in the head. The three men then got into a VW Santana and sped off. Down the road from the armory, two officers used their car as a roadblock, but the VW Santana plowed into their car. The robbers then got into a gunfight with the police, and the two officers were shot. The robbers then got back into the Santana and drove off. Later that night, they torched the Santana. Officer Claude Hallou died from his wounds, but the other two officers survived the shooting. Another crime that may be connected to the Brabant killers was the disappearance of Francis Swartz. Swartz was a security guard, and on October 26, 1982, he was transporting gold and documents. That night, he vanished without a trace, and he has never been found. The goods he was transporting also disappeared. He is not considered an official victim of the Brabant killers, but some people think that his disappearance is connected to the gang. On the morning of December 24, 1982, the son of Jose Vandenade found him dead in a room that he rented at an inn in Beersel Brabran. The 72-year-old had died a horrible death. He had been tied to his bed and tortured. He was killed when he was shot seven times in the head with a pistol. It's thought that his killers ate, drank, and even played a game during the night that they stayed in his room. Nothing appeared to be stolen from his room. Then, three weeks later, Angelou Constantine, a 58-year-old cab driver, was found shot to death in the trunk of his cab. It's thought that he was killed by a passenger or passengers that he picked up. Like Jose Vandenade, he had been shot multiple times in the head with a 22 caliber pistol. The two victims were connected in other ways. Notably, they had worked for the same taxi company. Also, 
They knew each other because they had both been involved in far-right political groups. The police looked into the possibility that the two men were assassinated because of their political views, but that line of investigation did not turn up any leads. On February 11, 1983, three men wearing masks robbed a grocery store at Jean Val Barbran. This time, they didn't kill anyone. They escaped in a Peugeot 504 that they had stolen days earlier. Three days after the robbery, two men in Peugeot 504 carjacked a woman driving a VW Golf. The Peugeot 504 was later found torched. On February 24, 1983, two men driving a VW Golf robbed a grocery store in Fort Jacko, which isn't in the Barbon province. It is in the nearby province of Yuk. Once again, no one was killed in the robbery. A week later, there was another grocery store robbery. Three, or possibly four masked men, entered a store in Halle, Brabant. This time, the manager of the store, Walter Verstappen, was killed after he was shot in the neck. The robbers got away in a VW Golf. Verstappen was pronounced dead at the hospital. On June 9, 1983, several men went to a car lot in Brown Alude, Brabant and they saw a Saab 900 Turbo. The only casualty was a guard dog that was shot 11 times. During the summer of 1983, the crazy Barbron killers were quiet. And on September 10th, 1983, there was a break-in at a textile factory in Temze, which is in the province of East Flanders. At least two men entered the textile factory and they shot the caretaker, 26-year-old Josef Broders, and his wife, 25-year-old Linda Van Huffling. The two robbers took seven high-quality bulletproof vests. A person who lived near the factory heard the gunshots, and he saw two men get into a Saab 900 Turbo and drive away. The witness who heard the gunshots called for help, and Broders and Van Huffling were rushed to the hospital. Broders was pronounced dead not long after arriving at the hospital. Van Huffelen was in a coma for several weeks, but she ultimately survived. On September 7, 1983, a week after the textile factory robbery, the police were called to a grocery store in Nival Barbara because the store's alarm had been triggered. When officers arrived at the grocery store, they were immediately hit with a barrage of bullets. 31-year-old officer Marcel Moreau was killed, and another officer was seriously injured. After the gunfight, the robbers made their getaway. The police looked around the grocery store, and they found two dead bodies. 49-year-old Jacques Ferez and his girlfriend, Elise DeWitt, who was also 49, had both been shot in the head. They had stopped at a gas station near the grocery store around the time of the robbery. Their white Mercedes-Benz had been stolen by the killers. This robbery was odd because of the items that were stolen from the grocery store. Notably, the robbers didn't take any money. Instead, they stole some coffee, five cans of corn oil, five cans of peanut oil, and some pralines. Just after midnight on October 2nd, 1983, about two weeks after the grocery store robbery, the staff at a restaurant in Ohai Barbara were closing up for the night. As they were closing up, two masked men with guns forced their way into the restaurant. They made all the employees lie down on the floor, and then they forced the owner, Jacques Van Camp, to go outside. Once they were outside, Van Camp was shot in the neck, and then the killers drove off in his daughter's VW Golf. Van Camp died at the scene. Five days later, 
the stolen VW Golf with three men inside of it, pulled into the parking lot of a grocery store in Bircel Bourbon. When they got out of the car, they were all wearing masks. Two of them were armed with guns, while the third man was carrying a Viking axe. They grabbed a man who was walking out of the store and used him as a hostage. With a gun held to his neck, they led him into the store. Inside the store, one of the men shot a cashier. 42-year-old Freddie Vermalen, the manager of the store, heard the gunshot and he came out of the office to see what the noise was. When he did, he was shot as well. Two cashiers and a customer were also hit with projectiles, but only Vermalen died. The masked men grabbed some money out of the office, then they walked out of the grocery store. They got into their stolen VW Golf and drove off into the night. They left their hostage unscathed. The gang went strike again for a month and a half. And on December 1st, 1983, three armed men entered a jewelry store in Andrew Barbron. They shot to death the owner of the store, 43-year-old Jean Samusic, and his wife, 38-year-old Maria Christina Slomak. The three men stole some jewelry and a revolver, and then they piled into a VW Golf and drove away. The burnt-out shell of the VW Golf, which was stolen from the restaurant two months earlier, was found later that night. After the robbery at the jewelry store, the gang seemed to go quiet, and the people of Belgium started to breathe a little bit easier. In 1984, there wasn't a single attack associated with the crazy Barbron killers. Most people assumed that they, or at least an integral member of the gang, had been arrested and jailed for another crime. Then, on the night of September 21st, 1985, a VW Golf was stolen from a car lot in Herb Square's Brabant. Six nights later, three men in a stolen VW Golf pulled up to a grocery store in Grand Ole Brabant. The three men emerged from the car wearing masks and carrying guns. One of the men grabbed a 12-year-old boy who was standing outside the store and used him as a hostage as they made their way into the store. When they got inside, they shot 39-year-old customer Gislaine Plantain. Plantain had confronted the man about using a young child as a hostage. He would be later pronounced dead at the scene. The gunman ordered the rest of the customers to get on the floor. They didn't think that 45-year-old customer Roger Engelman was moving fast enough, so he was shot and killed as well. Two of the gunmen grabbed some money and then the three men, along with their 12-year-old hostage, exited the store. When they got outside, they found 43-year-old Bozdar Jarowski sitting in his van. He had been waiting for family members who were inside the store shopping. The gang shot and killed him as well. Then the three men piled into the VW Golf and drove away. They left their 12-year-old hostage physically unharmed. Unfortunately, the gang wasn't finished for the night. Ten miles away from the grocery store, three men wearing masks parked their car near another grocery store in Overrise Barbon. Before they even got into the store, they shot two people, 14-year-old Stefan Nod and 31-year-old Luke Benekins. Both died from their injuries. Once they were inside the grocery store, they shot and killed two customers, 55-year-old Leon Finn and Jean-Pierre Busset. They ordered one of the cashiers, 37-year-old Rosa Van Klindock, to open her register. She started to open the register, but they thought she was moving too slowly, so they shot her to death as well. Then they grabbed some money and fled the scene. In total, that night, they killed eight people. A month and a half later, on November 8, 1985, 
Three are men who were dressed like soldiers and had scarves over their faces, parked their car near a grocery store in Alst, a city in the province of East Flanders. As they neared the store, they opened fire on a family of four. 43-year-old Gilbert Van de Steen, his 39-year-old wife, Teresa, and their 14-year-old daughter, Rebecca, were all killed. Nine-year-old Thomas Van de Steen was the only family member to survive the shooting. The three men then entered the store through the back and they started firing at anything that moved. This included shooting 28-year-old Dirk Niels and his nine-year-old daughter, Els. 33-year-old Marie J. Van Mulder, 62-year-old George Smith, and 42-year-old Jan Posterman were also shot. All five of them died because of their wounds. Besides the eight people who were killed, 15 other people were injured. As the three men walked back to their car, the police started to descend on the area. The gang fired at the police, and the police returned fire. The police were sure that at least one of the men was shot and suffered a fatal wound. But all three of them managed to get into the car. The men drove away from the scene, and the police chased them, but eventually they lost track of the car. The car was found a few days later. Like the other vehicles, it had been set on fire. The eight-person massacre was the last crime attributed to the crazy Bourbon killers. Over three years, it's believed that they killed 28 people, with Francis Wartz being a possible 29th victim. Often, the witnesses' descriptions of the gang members were slightly different, but there was a general consensus about the three men, who all spoke French. One of the gang members is nicknamed the Giant. He was described as being between 6'4 and 6'6, and he was thin. It's believed that he was the leader of the gang. Another member of the gang was given the nickname, The Old Man. He was described as a man in his 50s who was short and he often acted as a getaway driver. The third gang member is called The Killer. The killer was about 6 feet tall with dark hair and a dark complexion. He got his nickname because he committed most of the group's murders. It's believed that the killer was the gang member who was shot in the getaway from the final robbery. The police think that the killer either died as a result of his gunshot, or his fellow gang members killed him after he was shot by the police because they couldn't take him to the hospital without exposing themselves. However, as of right now, this is speculation because the killer's body has never been found. Or if his body has been found, he wasn't identified as the killer. Over the years, there have been several theories as to the identity of the gang members and what their motivations could have been. While they did steal items and money, theft didn't seem to be the primary motivation behind the reign of terror. One theory is that the gang was somehow connected to the gendarmerie which was a paramilitary group that was the police force in Belgium at the time. There are three main reasons why people believe this theory. The first is that the gang members seem to have police or military training. Secondly, at times, they seem to have inside knowledge of the Jomery's operations. For example, the gang members seem to know where the roadblocks were because they avoided them. The third reason is that the Jomery was never able to catch or identify the men. Since the gang members were never identified, there is a conspiracy theory that the Jomery supposedly let the killers get away with their crimes. However, critics of this theory point out that several members of the Jomery were killed and many more were injured during the crime spree. Experts who have done research on the case said that the gendarmerie was dysfunctional, but there wasn't some conspiracy that allowed the gang to escape justice. 
Errors in this case, and in the Mark the Row case, which we cover in the video Three Killer Couples, led to the formation of a new federal police force in Belgium. Another theory is that the gang was made up of members of the far left, or the far right, and they were trying to undermine the government. Officials with the police have said that they have not ruled out this possibility. Then in October 2017, 32 years after the last and most deadly raid, an unidentified man told a broadcaster in Belgium that his brother, Christian Manofsky, was the giant. Manofsky was a member of the Diane Group, which was an elite commando squad in the Gendarmerie. In 1981, Wynoski was dismissed from the group, and he was transferred to a police station in Alsp. He had been dismissed because there had been an incident where his gun accidentally fired. His brother said he was bitter about the dismissal, and he started drinking. He drank so much that he died in May 2015 at the age of 61. Wynoski's brother said that on his deathbed, he admitted to being the giant. It took his brother nearly two years to come to terms with his deathbed confession, and then he decided to go public. Several facts back up the idea that Bonofsky was the giant. First off, he looked like some of the sketches of the giant, and he was tall and lanky. Secondly, during the second wave of attacks that happened in 1985, Bonofsky was absent from his work at the Els police station. The police announced set roadblocks that the gang managed to avoid as they were making their getaway from their last robbery. Bonofsky was absent from work because he had an injured foot. Witnesses who were in the grocery stores during the second wave of shootings said that one of the gang members walked with a limp. In the year after going public, Bonofsky's brother was interviewed three times by the police. In the last interview, he admitted that Bonofsky did not admit to being the giant. He said that his brother just said he was involved with the gang. Then in October 2018, the police said that they officially ruled out Bonofsky as the giant. The only explanation they gave is that they compared his fingerprints to those that they had collected from the gang members and they did not match. Bonofsky's family was shocked by the news. They are sure he was involved in the gang because he admitted to it on his deathbed. They pointed out that when someone is on their deathbed, they do not make jokes about something like being involved in mass murders where children were killed. They said they weren't hoping that he was a killer, but by going public, it put a tremendous strain on their family. It wasn't something they would have done unless they were sure that Bonofsky was involved in the gang. Bonofsky's family gave the police his wristwatch, which should have his DNA on it. But the police have now compared the DNA on the wristwatch to the gang member's DNA, which they have samples of. Bonofsky's family said that it is possible that there was more than one giant at different times, and Bonofsky was one of them. The police have not made a comment on the possibility that the giant was multiple men. The police said they are continuing to investigate the crazy Brabant killers. In November 2015, the statute of limitations was going to run out on the last and worst massacre committed by the group. But then the court gave an extension of 10 years. The police and the people of Belgium are hoping by 2025, which will be the 40th anniversary of the worst mass murder, the members of the crazy Brabant killers will be identified and prosecuted. Thank you so much for watching, hopefully you found that interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please go to criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about an exclusive podcast. But well, that's all for today. Thank you again for watching.